Welcome to the Apache Druid Notebooks. My name is uh, Sergio Farragut, and uh, in this uh, series of videos, we'll review how uh, secondary partitioning works. Let's get started. When talking about secondary partitioning, we first need to uh, understand what primary partitioning is, right? So the uh, primary partitioning in Apache Druid is always on time. Right, the uh, ingestion jobs define segment granularity, which defines you know, whether you're subdividing time into days or you're dividing it into hours, minutes, maybe even seconds or larger like months. Uh, but then, so once you, you, you've decided what the, your segment granularity is, where we take raw data and we ingest it either from batch, batch files or from streaming data. And uh, the data has a time field that uh, is used to Let's select which day, if it's daily, uh, granularity, which they, the data belongs to, and the same is true for the streaming data. When you're partitioning, let's say, on day, and uh, you have a large amount of, uh, of data within uh, a day, you, you, there's uh, multiple reasons you'll want to subpartition. The, the, the efficiency of processing uh, data within Apache Druid based on testing has given us a bit of a rule of thumb to use uh, 5 million rows as the target size for uh, segment files. Uh, so if you have a lot more than 5 million rows within a day, you'll want to use secondary partition. So what secondary partitioning will do is take the, uh, the data within a day and subdivide it into multiple uh, different blocks of data and build uh, segment files. These are the uh, Apache Druid uh, columnarized and pre-indexed files. Uh, but you'll want to split it into multiple of those uh, for multiple reasons. The first reason that we already alluded to is segment size. Right? So the, the, the rule of thumb is about 5 million rows per segment. Or so if you have uh, 24 million rows, you'll want to divide that up into at least 4 or 5 uh, partitions uh, to get uh, you know, a bunch of uh, 5 million uh, row partitions. Um, in some partitioning uh, strategies, it'll provide data locality. This means the same values are grouped together and, and, and put into the same segment files, which uh, will help in, in compression and therefore help in efficiency. Another reason is parallelism. Parallelism is if I had to process all of the day two's data in a single thread uh, because I had a single file, it would take me more time to process that than if I split that file up into multiple files and have a separate thread process each of those files uh, because you know we, we can get the results faster if there's multiple workers process, processing the same subset of data. So anyway, it, it helps us with parallelism and that it will help our uh, performance of larger data sets. And in some cases it helps with pruning. This means that uh, it, it, based on the filter criteria that we have, uh, we'll be able to select just one of a set of uh, files for a given time chunk, or maybe a couple, instead of having to read them all. So that uh, that's what pruning does, and uh, different partitioning strategies give you different uh, pruning capabilities. So the first kind of secondary partitioning is called dynamic partitioning. This is the default. Uh, this is what uh, you'll get if you don't specify a partitioning strategy. And uh, a few characteristics about it, it's, it, it's the fastest form of ingestion, and uh, we'll talk about why it's the fastest. Generally creates pretty evenly sized partitions, and we'll talk about exactly how it works. Um, now, one uh, disadvantage is, is that it uses best effort rollup, and we'll talk about what that is in a second. It means it's only calculating partial aggregations, not full aggregations. Um, but it's the one that's used for uh, streaming ingestion, and we'll talk about why. So dy dynamic partitioning uses uh, single phase tasks. Um, Let's uh, we'll walk through this a bit. When you start a, uh, an ingestion job, a parallel index uh, ingestion job, so this, uh, this uh, a batch ingestion, uh, a parallel index task will, will get started. This controls the, the, uh, the execution of the multiple workers, uh, if there's multiple workers involved. So uh, with the parameter max num concurrent subtasks, if it's set to one, you won't have any additional workers. Uh, it'll just be the uh, the parallel index task that does the work, and it'll be a single single task, right? But if it's if you're processing more data and you need more parallelism to ingest it, you're going to want to uh, create a larger value here. Um, so if it's greater than one, you'll it'll try to spawn as many uh, workers as you specify here, but it will only be able to specify as many uh, as it has. Uh, portions of raw data to process, right? So in the case of batch, that's typically 
number of files that you have. So you know, you'll at least need to have uh, as many files as the number of subtests that you're asking for in order to achieve that level, the level of parallelism that you're looking for. So that's how it starts. Now, each of these is called a single phase task because it will go from raw data. Uh, each worker will take the, its subset of, of raw data, parse it, convert it, uh, classify it into time chunks, and convert it into segment files and publish them to, to deep storage. So it's the full ingestion process in a single task for a subset of the data. And each of these tasks uh, work uh, independently of each other. Now let's uh, dig in a little bit more. So each worker task parses it, it, its subset of data. It's, it's parsing all of the rows. And as it reads rows in, uh, it classifies them first on time, right? So it selects which time chunk it belongs to. And then it starts accumulating rows into each of those time chunks. As it accumulates rows, it's building up to a particular threshold before it, uh, it'll take that, uh, each of those segment files and output them to deep starts. So let's talk about what those thresholds are. So the first threshold is uh, max rows per segment. Uh, the way max rows per segment works is that is at each individual time chunk level within each task, right? So uh, th these are accumulating rows, and as they uh, accumulate rows and exceed max rows per uh, segment or achieve max rows per segment uh, that file will be closed the segment uh, will be created all the indexes are created and uh, any uh, any aggregation that you're asking for any roll-up is done um, and uh, then submitted to deep starch so that's occurring independently in each of these uh, time chunks right uh, across each individual parallel task there's another threshold, and that's a, more of a global checkpoint kind of threshold, which is called max total rows. With max total rows, what we're counting is the total number of input rows that we've processed across all tasks. And what we achieve, when we achieve that uh, threshold, the max total rows threshold, then everything stops across all of these. All of the segment or time chunk uh, partitions that, that, that have been accumulated to that point are all output together to uh, deep storage and all of the counters are reset. And so the jobs continue ingesting more data. So let's see how dynamic partitioning works. Let's do a quick demo. Uh, let's uh, load some sample data. Um, I'm gonna speed through the first part here and just get to the partitioning. Um, so here we're looking at the, the partitioning page where we have a segment granularity set to day. It's by default partitioning type dynamic and we're setting it to 10,000 rows. Uh, so we actually see multiple partitions because this data set only has 24,000 rows. Um, we leave the rest of it as is, uh, just change the name uh, to Wikipedia Dynamic so that uh, we recognize uh, which data source we're looking at the partitions for. Um, this just shows the, uh, the uh, spec and you know where the uh, partitioning uh, config is in the spec. So now we're waiting for the uh, job to complete. Um, I also edited out the wait time, so that was fast. Um, then you can look at the data source and look at the segments that it produced. So these are the three uh, partitions. Each of them is an individual segment file. And we can see that they each got 10,000 rows, at least the first two. So it cut off at 10,000 with the first two partitions. And then just the remainder uh, was stored in the last partition. We can look at the data by using a, a segment uh, metadata query. Um, this is an example of that. We just change the data source name, uh, apply the time filter. Here we're looking at a broad uh, time frame just to see, to get the whole thing. And uh, let's look at the channel column uh, and its distribution within those, par those partitions. So we see the channel column, its data type uh, in each of the three partitions that were created. And we can see the uh, cardinality of the channel value and the minimum and maximum value. You can see that uh, all of the partitions contain a broad range of values because there's no reorganization of the data here. So queries of this time chunk will always read all three partitions. Um, and take advantage of parallelism, but uh, won't be able to apply any pruning. 
So in summary, uh, dynamic partitioning is the fastest ingestion. It's the fastest because it has a single phase, right? It, uh, it, it's just processing the data once um, and it uh, produces segment files that are uh, evenly uh, sized for the most part. But, you know, it, it, uh, if you think about, uh, you know, within a time chunk, you have an even number of, of segments. If you have the, the max rows per uh, segment uh, set to 5 million, for example, and we have 25 million rows, then you'll get five. Uh, five files of exactly five million rows. But if you have some residual, let's say you have 21 million rows, then you'll have four partitions of five million and one partition of one million. So there will be some segments that are a smaller size when you have those residuals within the time chunks. But in general, it's producing you know, the, the, the size that you're asking for. It uses best effort rollup because, you know, we, we talked about each individual task is processing a subset of the data and doing the aggregation that you're asking it uh, to do but we have no control over the input data. It's split up uh, among the workers and multiple workers could have uh, data for the same time chunk and the same uh, dimension values. Um, so if we're doing some kind of sum or count, each worker is doing a portion of that. They get a portion of the rows and therefore they get a portion of the sum or a portion of the count. Uh, so you get partial aggregations ac across multiple tasks. So that's uh, what best effort rollup is. Now, when you're querying that data, the, the, the query engine will merge those results and produce a final, uh, a final aggregation, but that means it needs to do a little more work in order to uh, achieve that final aggregation. So this is the fastest at ingestion time, but at query time, it needs to do a little more work. It's uh, what's used for streaming ingestion precisely because they are completely independent tasks and because it's the fastest form of ingestion, the data doesn't need to be reorganized in any way. It allows for uh, excellent scalability when the throughput of the stream grows. Hey, thanks for watching. Um, please uh, like and subscribe below if you like what you saw and uh, let us know what you think.